This is Duke University. We've been talking about civil society uh, for the last 30 years. Um, we discovered civil society actually in 1970s and 1980s in Eastern Europe, when a number of scholars look at the emerging anti-communist opposition uh, under state socialist regime and discover that this opposition speaks a very ancient language, the language of human rights, the language of human dignity, uh, that was incredible discovery. Uh, so they started to talk about this as a, a emergence of a new civil society, a resurrection of civil society in Eastern Europe. We talk about this for 30 years, and I'm afraid that now is the time when someone will write the paper, the end of civil society paradigm. Uh, there is nothing more to say about this. We've you said everything. Um, and I think that would be very unfortunate. Uh, because we know very little after those 30 years. We have not achieved any firm consensus backed by any solid empirical data almost on any aspect of uh, issues scholars studying civil society are interested in. I'm going to uh, proceed in, uh, uh, in, uh, in five points. So first of all, I will look at the diverging outcomes of post-communist transformation. Um, and then look at the, how scholars explain the fact that some societies are doing better than other societies uh, in uh, former uh, Soviet bloc. And then I will move to a civil society uh, issues uh, and somehow summarize the big research program involved in studying civil society. And then I will talk a little bit about what we really know about civil society in Eastern Europe. And if uh, I have enough time, uh, I will uh, tell you something about this project I'm uh, currently working on. But of course, the big question is, uh, so how come that certain countries were able to introduce the right uh, economic and polit uh, reforms and to right political strategies and other countries were not able to do that. And of course, then uh, uh, scholars move one step back and look at the features of the transition process. Uh, the transfer of power was this key moment which then set up uh, 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 the context for the choice of reform strategies. And in this discussion of the transfer of power period, uh, usually, uh, the issue of Communist Party is emphasized strongly. And of course, we are trying to figure out at least three different things. First of all, what kind of impact civil societies have on undermining non-democratic political regimes? So what's the contribution of civil society into the collapse of authoritarianism and the collapse of communist systems? The second question we ask very often is the question about what's the impact of civil society actors on policy making, both economic and social policies. There is a number of books uh, trying to figure out how different actors are able to push the governments to adopt uh, various uh, types of policies or prevent governments from adopting various uh, uh, types of policies. And finally, there is this big question uh, about the relationship between civil society and democracy. So what kind of impact and what kind of relations there is between civil society and democracy? Now, it seems that there is a very little evidence that civil society had something to do with the collapse of communism in Eastern Europe, except for Poland. If one takes Polish civil society seriously and starts with 1980 with the solidarity movement with 10 million members and then everything uh, which happened after that, one could make credible argument that civil society in Poland had something to do with the collapse of communism in Poland. 
But when you look at the strength of opposition movements in any other East European countries, uh, it would be very difficult to make this kind of argument. Now, did civil society in Eastern Europe over the last 20 years had impact on social policies or economic policies? The problem is that we do not have much evidence for this. Uh, we don't have not, not much evidence because no one really did any systematic research on that. So there's a lot of anecdotal evidence that uh, you know, some NGOs were designing environmental legislations or some NGOs were sort of you know, designing bills in the parliament concerning human rights and so on and so on. There is a lot of uh, this, but not in, in a way that we could sort of measure that somehow and, 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 and decide that this was really decisive in the way in which policy unfolded in a specific period of time. Uh, we know that protest, working class protest in Poland uh, deflected a lot of uh, uh, reform measures or delayed a lot of reform measures and so on. But again, there is not much systematic uh, evidence uh, about this. The most mysterious uh, is the third question. We really don't know what's the impact of uh, civil society on quality of democracy in different East European countries. Does it matter that Poland has this sort of robust, contentious civil society vis-a-vis -vis Hungary? Is Polish democracy different than Hungarian democracy because you have those millions of strikes and protests taking place every day? One would assume that it may well be some sort of difference. But if we look at the Freedom House measures, for example, there's no difference between, between Poland and Czechoslovakia and Czech Republic and Slovakia and, and, and all those countries. Uh, so I think that we need uh, to know something more uh, in order to, uh, um, to really be able to say with some level of certainty uh, uh, about that impact of civil society. Produced by Duke University, online at duke.edu.